Our first presenter of the evening is going to be Dr. Terry Engelder uh, from Penn State University. He is, um, I guess, uh, one of the one of the leading uh, scientists who have uh, you know have, have done extensive research and written some papers on the development of the Marcello Shale. And um, Dr. Terry Engelder, please let's welcome him. Thank you, John. What a lot of fun to be here. Uh, as many of you are aware, I, I look forward to this for quite some time, particularly having the opportunity to go back to back with uh, Professor Tony and Gravia from Cornell. And uh, this we look forward to uh, for some length of time. We email back and forth. And uh, uh, I'm just so delighted that a number of you have turned out here and actually look quite interested in, in what's going on. Now, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, the process of, of natural gas collection. Actually, it's going to be wrapped up in this particular diagram right here. The success for America in producing natural gas is really going to be based on, I reckon, at least 12 different constituencies. And the circle starts, of course, with the landowners up here and actually ends with the end users. And it turns out maybe there are some landowners who are also end users, so they come back around on themselves. How many people use natural gas here, either to heat their home or something else? Now, I, it turns out I shouldn't have my hand up. I don't. I live out in a country where I don't have access to pipelines. And uh, so uh, my heating for my house and whatnot is electricity, and, and uh, uh, it turns out that America is going to be heading more and more towards the use of electricity, driving cars, and a lot of different things that we're doing. And so that might be the end goal of trying to understand the cumulative effects of natural gas. Now, this book will be published and released next June the author is Seamus McGraw, and the title of the book more or less captures the sentiment of a lot of people who have a stake in the Marcellus. And in fact, is Seamus will tell you that this is his mother's property, and that stake you see in the foreground there is the stake for a, a Chesapeake well drilled up in Susquehanna County. And of course, for that land there, that was the end of country, and we'll talk uh, extensively about that. Now, right here is Seamus, and that book that he's writing, really, the punchline of the book is, if we are to exploit natural gas, there's only one way to do it, and that's the right way. And uh, tonight, what we have are two people, Tony and myself, who will discuss this problem of what it is that it takes to do it right. And I, I think most of you are aware that this was advertised as a, as a balanced symposium, and I have to confess that I probably represent the uh, let's produce it side more so than Tony. And so I'm just going to label myself as representative of the environmental rewards. I think Tony is going to represent the environmental risks. Is that a sort of a fair uh, assessment of, 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 of what this is all about. So at any rate, the reason for Seamus right there is Seamus says, let's do it right. And basically, Tony and I have uh, the same objective, which is if it's going to be done, it, there's only one way, and that's the right way. And uh, I've heard this expression from a number of people, and it's worthwhile putting up here. Nothing in life is certain, and certainly production of natural gas is that way. It's not a perfect process, but it is a process that will require um, extensive attention to detail. And the function that, that, that both of us serve, I hope, and that means Seamus McGraw as well on all of this, is that paying attention to that detail, learning how to do it right, is a process that's not instantaneous. It takes the industry a considerable length of time to go through the process of learning how to do it right. And so we have the Soutners here from Demick, and they will testify to the fact that this didn't start out with 
companies automatically understanding how to do it right. Clearly, Demick was a case study of how not to do it. And it presented some challenges that we've learned. And hopefully, industry will move forward from that point. Now, in terms of background, Tony and I are identical twins. Both of us are interested in fracture mechanics. Tony is a world expert on fracture mechanics. To the extent that, uh, in terms of being identical twins, Tony and I have actually written together this paper with Tony's colleague, uh, B.J. Carter, right there. And in fact, is this is a picture that was in Tony's, uh, in this paper right here. And note, Tony, I've said that this particular outcrop is the one that has been published more times in the peer-reviewed literature than any other picture of natural fractures. These are hydraulic fractures. Now, um, one of the things I'd like to spend a little bit of time with is explaining a Philadelphia Inquirer editorial that was entitled Gusher of Hogwash right in here. This was an op-ed from April 28th, and uh, the purpose of this was to identify or at least point out that both sides of the natural gas debate have said a lot of things that, that, that anyone would argue was a, uh, a gusher of hogwash. Now, let me put an example of this up. This is a letter written by Cabot last fall. You recognize the chairman and president, Ding, assigns it, and it says, you continue to trumpet this fictional incident in an effort to stir up public opposition. Now, what he's talking about, of course, is the Ferentino well that uh, went horribly wrong on the 1st of January, 2009. Now, I put a disclaimer up here. I point out, of course, we all agree. I, I think everyone in the room would agree that that particular statement underlined right here is a gusher of hogwash. No doubt about it. But I say, while this paragraph is hogwash, don't take it out of context. This is an obvious step in Cabot's defense during the legal process in the Demick dispute with landowners. And don't think for a minute that Dingus even believes that this sentence is true. But it's, part, it's just part of the process that, that, that brings a lot of hogwash into the legal system. All right, now, um, what happened in this particular editorial is that, that I took on two or three issues, one of which was the methane loading of the atmosphere. In fact, as I've communicated with Tony, and, and I, I hope that he addresses some of these issues, because I regard that particular issue, methane loading of the atmosphere, as being one of the biggest unknowns in terms of long-term environmental effect. Now, um, there are two problems. One is the science problem, which is that there is an equivalence between methane and CO2. The science question, of course, is what is that equivalence? Then there's an engineering problem, which is leakage by gas producers and delivery systems right in here. Notice in the underneath part right here, I say that IPCC set the standard down here. This can be fixed. Now, let's look at these two particular problems. And what I want to do is use this to address how, uh, issues about how a scientist will work, because I think what you'll find is that, that Tony and I will talk uh, extensively, and we don't necessarily agree on all of the issues. For example, here's the fact, and any argument that comes up concerning natural gas has to be fact-based. And uh, in fact, is that fact is present, it's indisputable. What's in dispute, then, is the interpretation of that fact. And here are two interpretations. I put this in red, although this doesn't show up very well right here. The interpretation that global warming potential for methane is 72 times CO2 in a 20-year period of time. The other interpretation, this is actually the IPCC one, is that it's only 25 times methane. And so what we can assume is that, 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 that Tony and I might not agree on these two interpretations, but what we do is we, we treat each other with respect, we discuss this, and we discuss this in a civil way. Um, and in fact, is I would hope that, that over the years, Tony and I generally end up liking one another as a result of the process. Now, what I will argue, however, is that how Tony and I come out on this scientific argument is irrelevant. And the reason it's irrelevant is that there is an engineering argument, which is that this is a fact. Gas industry leaks methane. Now, then comes, uh, rather than an interpretation, 
of that fact, there comes a belief. One of the beliefs is that industry engineers can and will find and fix the leaks. This is a religion when I talk about a belief. The other possible belief is that industry engineers ignore methane leaks as unimportant. This is also, these are two extreme beliefs, but they're religious beliefs. And in fact, what then the argument might be if Tony and I have a difference is where you stand on that belief. Now obviously in the op-ed, which I've already told Tony, I was not even aware that he was involved with the methane uh, issue. I took the green, green light and uh, um, Tony might sit on the red light side. Now again though, even with beliefs, it is written in the federal statutes that you respect people of other, other beliefs. And, and again, you don't end up in a shouting match with one another, but um, you recognize those differences. So what, what happens here then? Um, nothing in life is certain again, and Engelder's faith in industry can lead to this. This is what happens when you have a belief that's a false belief. Now, then my challenge to industry, I've, I've just in this slide laid down the gauntlet. And the gauntlet is that I would hope that industry finds the leaks and fixes them. Otherwise, this will be my um, legacy on the tombstone when I die. I have an unabiding faith in American industry's ability to do it right. And that's, that's really what this is all about, is how, we're, how are we going to get to the point where we can do it right? Now, there are some other questions as well in this, one of which is, is it even necessary that we produce and burn methane? I want to address that issue, too, because, in fact, one of the long-term cumulative effects is going to be addressing that particular question. Now, this is a two-part talk. And next Monday night, I will present part two down in Hughesville. In, uh, and and uh, part two, actually, it turns out I've mixed these two together. I addressed part two, which is hydrocarbons dissolved in America's groundwater. Sorry, no, I, I haven't. I, I did address part two right down here, or I will address it in, uh, in, in Hughesville. Tonight, I'm going to go through three. What's the big picture? What is Kennedy's necessary sacrifice speech? Ask what you can do for your country. What does that have to do with natural gas anyway? And then finally, I'm going to spend some time talking about hydrocarbons dissolved in American, uh, America's groundwater. And I've spent a great deal of time studying the famous Meeks well in a Pavilion, Wyoming. And as many of you know, this was one of the, uh, Meeks was one of the stars in, in Josh Fox's gas lands. And I think I understand what's going on there well enough to at least um, in, inform the audience right here and in fact is draw some parallels between the pavilion case and the Demick case here in Pennsylvania. There are however some f important differences as well that I would really like to uh, like to point out as we go along. So that's where we're going with this. Now um, as an educator often education starts with a question. This is, is in, in, in one respect a Socratic way of doing things and the question starts out with a fact again, you to seven billion people. The Earth's population approaches seven billion people. The question is, is everyone on Earth entitled to as much energy as the average citizen in, say, Sullivan County uses to live comfortably? Now, uh, of course, there's a subsidiary question, which is, do the seven billion people on Earth right now have access to as much energy as you do here in Sullivan County? I think you know what the answer to that is. And then you can imagine what the consequence is to bring those seven billion people up to a lifestyle that you enjoy here in Sullivan County. And in fact, I will make the point that it takes energy to do that. Now, uh, one of the things that we will do is point out some of the literature I recommend any of you with a passion about energy and natural gas, read this book, The Bottomless Well. This is Huber and Mills, 2005. And this is one of the key diagrams in that book. Energy seems to be a fundamental input that determines both employment 
and productivity. And what we see from a period of 1950 onward to the present time is the American GDP right in here. That's basically the amount of uh, uh, output or if, if you like the uh, amount of dollars that uh, uh, was expended either through wages or some other means. And uh, here is the energy consumption in the United States over that same period of time, this dashed line, and then employment follows the same line. And now one of the interesting things is what you see, or what you conclude from this diagram, is that America is becoming more efficient with time. Productivity has gone from a point of, uh, this would be about uh, uh, seven dollars per uh, BTU, a thousand BTU consumed to fifteen dollars or something like that over time, so that, that basically what we can do is produce twice as many cars now as we did then. Unemployment and energy consumption track one another, however. And um, then I asked the question, if the energy economy connect and connection, energy economy connection is true, what would happen if the source of 20% of all American energy were turned off tomorrow? The asterisk, of course, points to as in fracked gas, because in fact, fracked gas produces 20% of the American economy, according to Huber and Mills. And so we turn off 20% of the uh, energy going into the American economy. That means a 20% drop in GDT, GDP, which is roughly $2.5 trillion. And of course, with that, we have a 20% loss of jobs, or if you like, everyone's income would drop by 20%. This is a reality of American society and the energy it takes to live the way that you and I do today. The big picture, of course, is there might not be enough toilet paper for everyone. Why? Toilet paper requires natural gas for drying. Toilet paper is a slimy vat of uh, fibers and whatnot, and natural gas is used to dry it. There's a big power, there's a big plant, Procter and Gamble plant just north of here that uses a lot of natural gas to assure that everyone has toilet paper. So it's one of the, one of the products of natural gas that, we, that we'd have a very hard time replacing. All right, so, um, now gusher of hogwash, that reminds you of Bill O'Reilly-like statements. They're very polarizing with an oblique reference to fact. So I'm, I'm, tonight I'm gonna represent the gusher of hogwash a little bit in terms of environmental devastation, nothing is more severe than total economic collapse. What you want to do is think about that for a minute. I really recommend a couple of books. World Made by Hand, this is a book by Kunstler, or The Road, if any of you read these two books. This is what total economic collapse is, and what this says, part of, a, part of Kunstler's book, a, a gang of motorheads mines the town dump in string abandoned, strips abandoned buildings for their aluminum window frames. The population is much smaller after a few well-placed bombs, a pandemic flu, and the government has ceased to exist. This is total economic collapse. All right, now the question of course is, how does America proceed forward assuring energy security? And you've all heard this too. This is another statement. It, you, you can argue that this is a gusher of hogwash. Notice the meter has gone over here. It's closer to green on this one. America's sustainability involves a robust economy built on energy security. Let's talk about that for a second. Now we get into some big numbers, which is what does it take to sustain the economy? Presently, America burns or uses on the order of 100 quads a year. A quad is a, is a quadrillion, here's a big number right here, British thermal units. And what you can do then is, is take the population of the U.S., which is about 300 million. Uh, 300, you can divide this number, 100 quadrillion by 300 million, and you find that, that each person every year lives a lifestyle that requires uh, on the order of several million BTUs for driving your car, taking your shower. I love to do this with students at, at Penn State when I have them in class. Takes a certain amount of energy to have a hot shower, doesn't it, I say to the students. And then I ask them the question, how much of that energy, how many BTUs to make that water hot actually warms your body as opposed to going right down the drain? And it turns out, of course, that somewhere on the order of between 90 and 99 percent of all those BTUs spent generating that hot water just go right down the drain. 
And uh, uh, I, caught, I talked a couple students back at Penn State into having lukewarm showers rather than hot showers with that particular statement. But that only lasts for a couple days, particularly in the wintertime. So this is the deal right in here. This is where America sustains its economy in terms of distribution of, of fuels. You can read this right here. And the interesting thing is this curve right here. The energy consumption in the United States between 73 and 2009. Obviously, we're increasing. This is the effect of the economic downturn. You might say, well, did someone cut off our energy right in here like this? No, what happened was the economy went sour. And with the economy going sour, the demand for energy just uh, actually went down dramatically, almost like falling off of a cliff. But that's not the whole point to this. The whole point is as follows right in here like that. U.S. oil production peaked in 1970. Notice where I have the line right here. We were consuming somewhere on the order of 75 trillion quads. 75, sorry, 75 qu uh, uh, quadrillion BTUs when U.S. hit peak oil production. Now what happened since then, of course, is that to maintain this economy, the use of coal really didn't go up. The use of natural gas really didn't go up. What happened was, uh, the amount of petroleum imported increased and it filled this gap right in here. And uh, the reality, of course, is that you thought that I was talking about cutting off of natural gas when I presented this uh, Huber and Mills diagram. Well, I wasn't really talking about that. I was talking about what happens when imported petroleum is cut off by people who don't like us very much. The U.S. gross domestic product drops by $2.5 trillion and uh, everyone has a salary. I'm going to keep everyone employed, incidentally. I'm just going to take 20% of the money away from you that you have right now, and you're going to live on 20% less. So uh, fortunately, though, in this scenario, there's enough toilet paper for everyone, largely because the toilet paper manufacturing uses what's American, whereas driving SUVs might be an issue because, of course, you drive an SUV off of imported energy. All right, so that's, that's basically the big picture. I like this cartoon. It's not the money I mind, but your lack of dependence on foreign oil makes me feel so un-American. Big SUV. Um, enough said. Now, let's take a look at this particular diagram. What is the potential for shale gas? Now, obviously, again, I come here as, an, as a shale gas enthusiast, and I will point this out. First of all, shale gas offsets other declining U.S. supplies of gas. This is non-associated gas right here. Basically, this means conventional gas. This, this uh, uh, onshore uh, gas supply for America is running out. We need to replace it. Now, the strategy for replacing it up through 2008 was to expand and become increasingly dependent on imported natural gas. Well, that's the same pathway that we're walking down with oil. All right, that's, that's, that's number one. Now, number two, of course, is that with the expansion of shale gas in here, this lowers import needs. And you can see how the, it, the imports gradually are shut out while shale gas expands. This basically assumes a rather steady state use of natural gas going into the, into the future. Very interesting observation. The Penn State press release, which got everyone all excited about the Marcellus, occurred on January 17, 2008. Now, you can look at this graph and fully appreciate why that Penn State press release, in the longer view of history, proved to be so important. Look at the expansion of shale gas starting right at this particular point in time. And in fact, is January of 2008, everyone was leasing their land for about $100 an acre. Very shortly after that press release, people were getting upwards of $5,000 an acre. It was really spectacular. All right, now, um, I think one of the important things that I would have pointed out to Josh Fox if he were here is that fracked gas is not just 10 to 20 percent of the gas we use. Fracked gas, in fact, is even right now is more than 50 percent of the gas. Coal bed methane, it's tight gas right here, and it's in its gas shales. So that the energy portfolio, if, and this is, this is still an if, if we move forward on gas rather than replacing it with, with some other form of energy. And here's, here's where the really 
the debate gets to be a lot of fun, of course, is do we move, move forward on gas or is it some other alternative that we, we, we find? And um, number two, Kennedy's ask what you can do for your country. Notice again, um, I attribute this to myself right here. This is, this is an interview I gave last spring and uh, I, I grade myself as it may be a little bit in the green here, but what this says is my heart goes out to the landowners whose mineral rights have been severed. It's that type of sacrifice that we're making, we're talking, uh, that we're talking about as a necessary for sacrifice. Now I've communicated with lots and lots and lots of reporters. Anyone that has done that, I know the politicians in the back of the room attempt this all the time and it's extraordinarily difficult. Isn't that right, Senator Yaw? It's tough to get a reporter to write exactly what you want him to write. And this is a good example of that because in fact, really what I was doing was I was aiming at the people affected as in the people endemic. Um, as the industry learns how to do it right, these people were actually the vector, the focus of an industry that was fumbling around and didn't get it right. And uh, in fact, is right there is a, a, a trophy from that, I understand. The people of Dimmick were the ones that should have been included in this statement. It's a necessary fa sacrifice to learn this. Now, uh, the reason I say that is that this is an extraordinarily complex industry that will not learn if it's not allowed to practice. It just it has to practice. So then maybe the question is, how fast does the industry move forward in learning how to do it right? Um, it is, I, I think, entirely true that the industry doesn't learn how to do it right if the industry is shut down. Industry has to be given space to figure it out. And uh, uh, then we have the role of the policeman, the policeman meaning the environmental protection agencies of the states and whatnot. These policemen have to be ever vigilant in trying to get industry to do it right. I love this one. I, it, bloggers and I have a great interaction with one another right here. Here's Frack, and uh, the Frack, Frack had, a, had a lot of fun with his Voices interview that I gave last summer. What Frack did was uh, he, he quick, uh, 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 I, I love this picture. This is Peter Sellers right here, incidentally. If you don't know that old movie, Dr. Strangelove, and it says right in here, uh, in consideration of his longstanding service as Penn State professor and very influential consultant to leaders in government, business, education, the good doctor has assumed the position of arbiter of best interests and necessary sacrifices. Um, yeah, that's, uh, people have sacrificed. And in fact is right now what's happening is that, that the people of Sullivan County are being asked to sacrifice. The sacrifice, of course, is that um, this is an industry that can't come in without leaving some scars behind. It's necessary to build drill pads. It's necessary to run pipelines and whatnot to exploit this energy. So really then the question comes down to uh, one of which, uh, how does America move forward into the future? What is its source of energy? I've already made the case. The premise, of course, is that energy consumption and the economy and your lifestyle really are locked together so completely that we can't suddenly decide, well, we don't need that, 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 that energy. So how do we move forward? I love this one. Leaders take the arrows. This is the Sierra Club. And recently, the president of the Sierra Club has come out in favor of natural gas using new technologies. Oh boy, the bloggers had fun with that. And uh, um, the question here is, what is the gold standard for insulting the president of the Sierra Club if you don't like his policies towards natural gas? Anyone know what the answer to that is? Don't say it if you've, you know what the answer is. But uh, anyone know what the answer is? Yeah, okay, good. There are only two or three of you, so the rest of you will, will be amused at this. I was. The president of the Sierra Club is compared with the master of hogwash. Who's that? Yeah, that's me. Uh, this statement that the uh, blogger made was, Pope ranks right up there with necessary sacrifice Engelder in terms of un-American notion that elitists know that what's best for us. Oh, well, all right. So this is part of the fun of all of this, is that we are, we, we're, we're talking this out, and um, 
even that's a necessary sacrifice. So I asked right in here, wasn't President Kennedy asking people to consider doing things that might benefit the country more than themselves? And, and the point I was making to this reporter in Voices was that, in fact, the people of Dimmick have already done that in spades. And it's, 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 their sacrifice hopefully will if the gas industry continues to evolve, benefit other people, the people living in someplace else in Bradford County, for example, have the people of Dimmick to thank for pointing the industry in the right direction, getting them straightened out. Now remember, again, let me remind you that I come from the religion that has the faith that the industry can get this straightened out and they can do it sooner rather than later. And this is, this is a, a, a religion and nothing else. Why are river keepers Bobby Kennedy and MSP, Marcella Shale, protest not on the same page of the playbook? The answer is right here in Sullivan County. And um, this particular scene right here, this is actually a well-known scene, uh, MSP, this is the road to desecration. And what Bobby Kennedy would say is this is the road to sustainability. Now, why would he do that? Um, I just remind you that the ad in the, in the uh, Williamsport Sun Gazette had that same picture. Well, uh, what I can do actually to answer the question is take a look at some drilling locations. You've all done this before. This is uh, uh, Josh Fox in front of the Wind River Mountains up there in Pinedale. And uh, my wife always looks at Josh Fox with his gas mask on and reminds me that, that in 1971, the exploration for natural gas, America recognized that fracturing was the key to obtaining natural gas, but look at the technique that was used in 1971. It was nuclear stimulation. In fact, the Western Colorado site that, that, that Fox visits during his movie, Rolison, was the site of a nuclear blast. Another one was scheduled for this particular field, right where Josh Fox is standing there. Uh, the name of that was the Wagon Wheel Nuclear Stimulation Project. Basically, that project was to blast the living daylights out of this area right here, putting fractures in it, the same way that industry is doing now with hydraulic fracturing, but uh, doing it in a way that, that proved to be fruitless. And the reason for that, of course, was that after the nuclear experiments, the gas that was produced came up as radioactive gas, and it was worthless as radioactive uh, material. So one of the other things I'm going to do here is again show the uh, evolution of American gas play. This is one square mile right here. This again is the Jonah Field where uh, Josh Fox was standing in front of the Wind River Range. Notice the numbers right here, 16 wells per section. And uh, let's take a look now at what those wells are doing. EPA, as you know, is having a study as we speak concerning hydraulic fracturing. And this particular diagram that may have been put up distinguishes between the gas plays of Colorado and of Wyoming. And those plays are tight sand plays where vertical wells are searching around for these sand bodies. You can't drill a horizontal well in those sand bodies. They don't go far enough to be economically reasonable. So what that means is basically a whole bunch of vertical wells have to be poked into the ground searching for those sand bodies. And that's the distinction between the western plays that were visited in uh, Josh's movie and the Marcellus. The Marcellus is one play where you can actually go down from one drill pad and go in any direction without running out or without driving the drill bit out of the formation. This is an incredibly important distinction between fracking in the western United States or at least in the Rocky Mountain region where there are some gas shales but they haven't been exploited like the Marcellus and what's going on particularly in the Pine Hill area and whatnot. Now, um, Let's look at fracking in Pennsylvania just for a second here. I love this picture. Um, that's a cover of my book right here pointing to Bradford, Pennsylvania. And in Bradford, Pennsylvania, this is what you see. Oh, actually, wait a minute. That's not Bradford. That's Titusville. This is what it looked like just after oil was discovered in Pennsylvania. Note the, eight, the date right in here. Uh, it's 1868. Titusville well was 1859, so you're nine years into the oil boom right in here. Notice that this is drilling at the rate of four to six wells an acre. 
Or, now remember, a section is a square mile, so that back in the 1800s, somewhere between 2,500 and 3,800 wells were drilled per section. So that's 2,500 to 3,800 drill pads, and that's a bunch of them. So we move forward in time into the early part of the 20th century, and here is a Devonian field, in the Bradford field, I was at Roustabout. My first job was in this particular field right here. In fact, as you see, this, this, this ring finger of my right hand was crushed while I was being a Roustabout, caught between two pieces of, of casing right there. It happened in a, uh, uh, a field more up to the northeast from this one. There's a mile right there, so let's look at this field right in here like this. And what we see is that within that one section right there, one square mile, there are 140, 104 well pads. Wow. And uh, what we're going to do is zero in on one well pad right there. Here it is. And uh, you can actually see the Jer derrick right here. This is oil drilling, incidentally, not gas drilling, 300 feet. But during oil drilling, the oil in Pennsylvania was starting to deplete as early as 1880. And so the oil industry went into a process called secondary recovery. And during secondary recovery, hydraulic fractures were driven from vertical wells out about 300 feet on either side. So this is a double winged fracture off of a vertical well. The idea was that if you fractured here and pumped water down that well, then you could drive a water flood straight across this region, driving oil into these recovery wells right in here. And that proved very, very successful in Pennsylvania. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of wells hydraulically fractured for secondary recovery. All right, now let's consider the alternative. And we're back to Bobby Kennedy. This is coal. I put up that one square mile, that one section, and shown you a uh, mine right here. This is what mountaintop removal does. There are at least three sections per mine removed. Everything is gone. Every blade of grass, every dandelion is removed from that. And uh, let's go back now to Sullivan County and put in this one four acre drill pad and compare that to this area right here, which would be about the area of mountaintop removal if that were allowed in Sullivan County. Now, no one would, in the right mind would do that. All right, so the subject right now, benzene, methane, methane, toluene, you've all seen these statements in the newspaper. So my nephew took it to school in the 60s, and the science teacher lit it and said it's methane. And uh, this one I like even better. It's a statement that says, as a teenager in the 50s, it was a morning ritual for students to try to be the first into high school, which was the top floor of the building, and light the fire, uh, the first draw of water from the water fountain to create a momentary flame. So the reason that I show this, uh, and I ask the question, how many people in the auditorium suspect this woman has been bribed by the gas industry? I see two, three, four, five, six hands. Yeah, actually, so the previous slide, her name was Losi. Was she bribed as well? Okay, well, all right. So there's a, the, the, now we're talking about a, 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 a belief. Um, the majority of the audience who's of one religion, which is they believe she's telling the truth, but there is a minority religion in the off, uh, audience, audience that, that these two people were bribed. I hope they're good and rich from being bribed. Um, these, uh, very interesting then, um, was this guy bribed by Josh Fox to light his faucet? How many people believe he was bribed? Uh, all right, not a hand. I'm, I'm pleased. We're, there's a consensus. That's known as, as a universal religion. At any rate, you're well aware that this was biogenic methane right here. And so, um, as you know, Colorado, the state of Colorado has questioned whether biogenic methane has anything to do with natural gas drilling. I think the question really becomes moot when I point out that the Antrim gas shale here in the upper peninsula of Michigan is America's largest biogenic methane deposit. Twenty years ago, actually more than twenty years ago, I was consulting for uh, Shell Western and Shell Western recognized that the Antrim was cracked and full of fractures. And um, in fact, that was when I first actually learned about the potential of gas shales more than 20 years ago. And at that time, it was very clear that this was biogenic gas that was being exploited in the Upper Peninsula. All right, now, 
Um, if you believe then that the two women from Susquehanna County were bribed, you're really going to love this. This is a Penn State experiment where I'm drilling into the Marcellus down in Northumberland County. Northumberland County is down the Susquehanna River, well south of wherever the Marcellus is economically productive. And when we drilled this well for core sampling right here, the uh, core barrel comes out of the center of the drill. So this is called wireline drilling. And you understand that about a 15 foot length of core is collected then pulled up the drill stem. And of course, as the core gets pulled up the drill stem, why water is pulled out of the well ahead of that. That's called unloading the well, taking out the water from the well. And what happened when we unloaded the well at 973 feet is we had the blowout. You recognize this is natural water. This is methane coming out of the well right in here. And you can also recognize that these three guys jumped off of this platform very, very rapidly. and. Um, the, the point right here is that if you think that methane demonstration in Colorado in gas lands was exciting, can you imagine what would happen if this got lit? And uh, um, you wouldn't be standing around that. I wouldn't be standing around that. Clearly, the driller was not standing around that waiting for it to be lit. All right, so this is fresh water. There's methane from 973 feet. I call this the Penn State blowout. And... Um, we're going to compare that with the Meeks blowout. Now, again, Meeks is one of the stars from western uh, uh, Wyoming, and he had a, a much more severe blowout than the Penn State blowout shown right here. And you can see this again in Gaslands. And the question was, what happened? Well, one point I want to make before I answer that question is, gas at hydrostatic pressure, that's what this gas was, that what, that's what Meeks's gas was, flows in blowout fashion only when the well is unloaded. Now Meeks also, he says this in Gaslands, in the film, I pulled or pumped water out of the well, and it was only after pumping water out of the well that the well gushed gas for three days. This is different from the stimulation of the clear fuel blowout, which where the gas came out under very, very high pressure. And industry has to deal with that high pressure blowout. So I want to draw that distinction. Meeks's well, the Penn State well, was nothing like the clear fuel, clear fuel blowout. That was really a very serious thing that, that industry doesn't want to repeat. And we hope that the DEP and the inspectors keep that from happening ever, ever, ever again. But as we say, nothing in life is certain. Uh, in this business. All right, uh, what happens in, in, uh, in the case of Meeks as well? This is where Meeks as well is in Wyoming. It's north of the um, Wind River Range. Here is the same exercise with one section right there. We see 15 wells per section. I'm going to zero in on this and point out that the first well drilled in this area for natural gas was drilled in 1962. It was a shallow uh, gas show at less than 1,000 feet in that well right there. Presently, the shallowest production is 699 feet. Now keep this number in mind. Gas is coming. Producible economic gas is coming from 699 feet. The Marcellus, for example, here in Sullivan County is as much as seven to 8,000 feet deep. So we're talking about two different levels of gas in the, in the earth. One, a very shallow gas. Another, the Marcellus, relatively deep. And uh, here is Meeks again. Now notice where Meeks's house is. This is the 1962 well. This is the shallow well. There's Meeks's house. There's less than a mile between either of these, these wells in Meeks's house. Basically, when he bought that house, he, he, he ended up living right in the middle of a gas field. Now, I don't know whether his parents owned it and this was a legacy or whether he bought into the house. Um, but th that, th there he is. And this is, this is what I, I think happened. And I'm going to show you some things that are all in the public literature. Very interesting. Um, in the state of Wyoming, as in the state of Pennsylvania, wells are designated by counties. This is, this is uh, 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 county number 13, and the well number right here, 22625. This is a well that produced oil, and oil was coming out of the ground at a distance of less than a mile. This is a mile right in here. So oil and all of the hydrocarbons associated with oil are being produced from a relatively shallow level at a depth or at a distance of less than a mile from Meeks's house. 
Now, what, what, what happens right here anyway? Um, the pavilion area, the area where there's a lot of natural gas, is a naturally leaky gas system with gas accumulating in all the sands at all depths. Now, remember I said the pavilion area, Pinedale on the south side of the Wind River Range, all of those are tight gas sands where gas forms in pockets. It's not continuous. And in order to exploit it, you have to drill a lot of vertical wells poking around here and there to try to find the stuff. And so that's what was going on in and around the Meeks field. Fact is, geologists can put up a stratigraphic section of that and point out, for example, that the source rock, the equivalent of the Marcellus, because all gas comes from source rocks, is the Cody Shale down at greater than 13,000 feet right in here like this. Now, what was the company exploring for around Meeks's house? And uh, in fact is they were looking for reservoir rocks at less than 3,500 feet. So the entire play right in here, to the best of my knowledge, is at half the depth of the Marcellus. And that really matters an awful lot in terms of what is about to happen. In order to explain what happened, however, I have to point out that all petroleum reservoirs give off soluble hydrocarbons. And the soluble hydrocarbons, in fact, are the famous ones. Benzene, toluene, xylene, and some more. The B-Texas, the things that you hear about as being relatively dangerous. So that, that if there is a, this is, this is a, 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 um, um, a theoretical paper published in the uh, uh, groundwater, one of the groundwater journals, and from the you win a basin which is down here. Uh, and again, Jonah Field is there. Meeks as well is right here. But the architecture of this then in terms of the source rock is pretty much the same. Basically, there's a plume right around here of these BTEX hydrocarbons dissolved in groundwater so that it, in a sense, anyone that's living in or near a potential hydrocarbon uh, producing layer called a source rock, and the Marcellus is that, can expect that there is a plume of these soluble hydrocarbons over it that are naturally occurring. And this is, of course, the situation in the pavilion area. All right, now you can go to the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and download records of the wells that are drilled around Meeks's house. Now what you see is a casing that goes down right in here. The bottom of the casing is cemented. Here's the surface casing that presumably protects the groundwater. And here's the production string right in here. And what you see is there just are a whole bunch of uh, holes shot into this. Up from the bottom, basically these are perforations that, that go through that steel casing. We count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14 different layers between 3,500 feet and 1,400 feet were perforated. And uh, what each one of those layers is a little sand that's producing gas. The gas production is uh, stimulated. Here's the number of gallons, for example, that was pumped into this top layer right here. Now, just as a reminder, every stage in the Marcellus has somewhere between uh, half a million and a million gallons pumped into it. So this is small potatoes relative to a frac job in the Marcellus. And um, you can actually read these records from the State Oil and Gas Commission and determine exactly how much was pumped in there and where it was pumped, et cetera, going up and down the well. Fact is, you can even download the production data right in here like this. And what you recognize here, this graph on the vertical axis is thousands of cubic feet a, feet a month, which means that uh, this well was drilled in 1994, uh, for example. It produced until about 2000 where the flow in that well was relatively low and then the well was re-stimulated and here we have a well that's producing somewhere on the order of 32 million cubic feet a month. Basically the flow out of this vertical well after re-stimulation is equivalent to the flow out of one stage of a good Marcellus well. And uh, the, it turns out then that the amount of water used, you can do the calculation, and I thought I had a slide that demonstrated this. You can do a calculation and realize that the amount of water used per uh, unit of natural gas returned is an order of magnitude less 
for these tight gas sands than gas shales like the Marcellus. You might say, why did people go after these tight gas sands? Well, you need a whole heck of a lot less water to do it. All right, now going back to the movie, Gaslands, this well right here is 500 feet away from Meeks's house. Now this distance, I, 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 I just asked the, the Souders right here uh, about Carter's well, Ron Carter down um, Carter Road, and Cabot, bless their souls, drilled a well within, actually I think it's probably about 300 feet from Carter's front door. And it, it just, you, you look at that and you say, my golly, what were these people thinking about that they would put a well that close to the front door of a house, but they did. And I'm afraid they've, they've learned that, that that probably is not a, not a real good idea. But at any rate, here, so here's Meeks, he's got the same problem. A well that's 500 feet away, this is 1322236. 2, you can look this up in the Wyoming Oil and Gas Commission and learn all about it. It's called the Tribal Pavilion 2402. And the Tribal Pavilion 2402, um, shows this record. I've drawn, the, I've drawn the casing right in here. The shallowest perforation in this well, 500 feet from Meeks's house, is 1,500 feet below the ground. So you can imagine going over 500 feet, which is about this dimension, and then down about three times that much. And if you take the hypotenuse of that triangle, um, that means that this top perforation here is Oh, I don't know, the hypotenuse here is maybe 2,000 feet from Lewis Meeks' front door. So it, 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 this, is, this is really close in. Now, for comparison, the Meeks blowout, in, and you hear this in, in gas lands, occurred at 240 feet because he unloaded as well. So that's the relative depth of the Meeks blowout. Here's the Penn State blowout at this particular depth. So in all three cases, we're dealing with very shallow ga gas right in here. This is not what the situation will be in Sullivan County as the producers work to do it right. And uh, uh, all right, now, let's look at the history of this particular well, 22236. It was drilled in 2004, and I put a date line right here. Actually, it's late 2004. The cement return was inadequate and more cement was injected. Now, I should point out, the present owner of this particular field acquired it about this time. In fact, is as far as I can tell, it was the previous company that actually drilled the well and had this particular problem right here. But you all have gotten smart enough to know that whenever you read a well completion report that says cement return inadequate, and more cement injected, the people of Demick know exactly what that means. Um, and you, you can just, you, 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 all, all you need to do is see that and, and realize what uh, uh, the, the problem is in, in and around the Meeks well. And this, this is one of the biggest issues that that's still faces the operators in Pennsylvania. They are learning how to cement wells. And uh, one would hope that, that this is getting a lot better than it was three years ago, proper um, cementing of wells. So at any rate, what happened was in April of 2005, then Meeks actually contacted uh, the, the present operator who then bought the, bought the company sometime right in here about the well problem. That's how soon it was that, that, that Meeks sensed that something was going on. And uh, October of 2005, then the company uh, determines that Meeks' well uh, had deteriorated by having bacteria in, on the inside of it and uh, provided Meeks with a water supply and whatnot. December of 2005, Meeks attempts to drill a new well which blows out from the depth of 240 feet. This is the well that appears flowing gas in gas lands. I'm not sure how uh, Josh Fox got a hold of that clip that actually shows gas coming out of the well. well I, I suppose a lot of people had video cameras back then so that, that, that uh, um, he acquired that from someone else. He didn't film that because he wasn't there then. Um, we have the uh, Meeks actually signs a settlement agreement then and uh, here's the Penn State press release and some months after the Penn State press release then uh, in the winter of 2008-2009, Josh Fox meets the Meekses, and Gasland is history. But that's roughly uh, what, what has happened right in here. Now, um, EPA, as you know, is doing an experiment. In fact, is 
the reason that this particular situation in the Meeks well is so critically important is that this is where the federal government is testing the hypothesis that frac fluid can enter groundwater. And, and, and so what I'm going to do now is discuss public information put on the web concerning that, that very question. And what you do is you go out and you measure as many chemicals as you possibly can. And so the sequence here was that the former owner of this well uh, uh, has a shallow production at 699 feet right in here like this. Then there is the uh, wells drilled by the subsequent owner down to roughly 3,900 feet. Now remember, these are vertical wells. They're poking around for these sand layers that have gas in them. And this really is a little bit of a braille technique. You go down and uh, you hope you hit these things. It's very difficult to define these things clearly uh, any other way. So this is, this is the well going down to 3,900 feet. Uh, we have the Meeks blowout right here at, at 100 and, or 240 feet. Now, what happens is one of these legacy wells becomes part of the EPA data set right in here. I should point that out. This would be an EPA well for sampling flowback water. Here's an EPA well that was drilled as a monitor well. And then another Meeks well was sampled at a fairly shallow depth right in here, less than 100 feet. So EPA, in sampling the chemistry, has a very nice experiment and are, uh, based on what the chemistry is in the well, they're going to be able to make some really rather strong statements about what they think might have happened in the well. Now, first of all, we have to remind everyone that these chemicals that include these additives that include uh, chemicals, actually, these are not additives in wells. Benzene, there's a level of tolerance for a maximum contamination level, maximum con uh, uh, contaminant level. MCL right here for benzene, toluene, copper, lead, and whatnot. And uh, let's see if we can infer some things about the data that come back from this well. I've identified the EPA data in three classes right in here. And what you can do, you see green, I won't talk about them uh, uh, directly, but I will point out that, that, that let's, let's look at a, uh, a, a naturally occurring hydrocarbon called adamantane. In adamantane, you see in the red, adamantane is reasonably high. Here we have adamantane in the blue. It's considerably lower. Then we had adamantane in the green. It's lower yet. Uh, benzene is found in red in huge quantities, in blue to lesser extent, and very little in green right in here. And you can, you can basically read this chart up, up and down. Benzene, xylene, Here's methane right in here, considerably lower in the green wells than anything. Well, what it turns out is, of course, these are the produced waters from the fairly deep wells. And uh, these are waters that are in EPA monitoring wells. And this is uh, some of the private wells, including Meeks's well. Meeks's well is PGDW05 right in here like this. And what you would conclude then concerning the soluble hydrocarbons largely is that the soluble hydrocarbons, the closer you get to the source rock, the more of those there tend to be. Now what is really important about this is you look for chemicals, this is 2BE right in here, you look for chemicals that have nothing to do with natural production of hydrocarbons. And this is one of them. Chloroform, incidentally, is another one right in here. And you test for those things. And uh, what you see right in here is that the shallow Meeks well contains some of this stuff. This is a plasticizer and whatnot. But uh, the rationale here, of course, is that if you find this in the shallow Meeks well, and it's associated with hydraulic fracturing, hydraulic fracturing is going on down here. And you don't see that. And so then it becomes a little bit harder to say that deep hydraulic fracturing is contaminating shallow groundwater. Extraordinarily difficult, as a matter of fact. So um, just a couple comments about benzene, toluene, uh, let's see, paraxylene right in here. These are ring hydrocarbons. These are the hydrocarbons that you can smell. And uh, uh, they have this particular shape. They're highly soluble hydrocarbons right here. Here's an, uh, a Scientific American article right here saying the drinking water might be from natural gas. 
and the caption right here lead, reads, Meeks's well contains lead and copper in particular, and uh, at least by implicit statement then, this comes somehow or another from industry, but in, in reality what you do is you go back and you look, yeah, Meeks's well contains copper and lead, copper at seven parts per billion, lead at less than one part per billion. Then you go back here and look at the, this is in parts per million, uh, you realize that the maximum allowable limit for copper, for example, in, in the well is uh, 1300 right here. Actually, this is MCL, EPA MCL. This is what was found in Meeks' as well. This is what the allowable limit is. Basically, that um, copper and the lead are at the levels that they would be found in any water well in the state of Pennsylvania. So uh, what we can do then is conclude that in the winter of 2008-2009, Meeks tells Gaslands that groundwater uh, has glycol, eth glycol ether in it. This is the B-tox that we've heard about. And, sorry, uh, uh, 2B, 2BE, a widely used solvent in paintings and uh, surface coatings uh, and cleaning products and the like. And what we, what we conclude looking at that, with the, and I did this with the help of colleagues, this analyst of, of Meeks' situation, I want to read this to you. After reviewing public data, it became apparent that, if anything, there was a surface release of industrial fluids, not an upward subsurface migration of frac fluids from the gas bearing formation into the aquifer. A recent press release indicates that Encana is or was closing some of the surface impoundments that had elevated levels of petroleum hydrocarbons. Basically then, what this is saying is, this stuff is coming from the surface. So that then we circle back around to the original uh, um, statement about doing it right. The real focus on this industry is a focus on surface management. Can the industry manage surface waters in a way that is sensible, reliable, and one that, that is, is uh, safe? In our uh, discussion for this event, that he was going to be giving a, a full 50 minute a uh, time slot to do his presentation just as it would be for a Penn State uh, class. And uh, I, I think we're, we're, all, we're around there. I wasn't keeping strict watch of the time, but I believe that, uh, Dr. Engelder, do you have a few more minutes here? Are you, are you, are you sure, sir? All right, well, I, th I think at this point we should Thank Dr. Engelder for coming here, for giving his presentation.